The Fermi Paradox Part 25 Fear the Reapers I love Mass Effect. I know I'm not alone. BioWare's masterpiece is the defining space opera of the video game medium. A rich, dense, complex universe made entirely from scratch. Even if assembled from a few pre-made pieces, as all space operas have been. For those not in the know, who, given my channel's demographic, are probably my family, Mass Effect is a single story spread over three individual games, the outcome of which depends largely on the player's choices. Choices made during one game can be loaded into the next, rippling across the entire story, their consequences felt hundreds of hours later. The overall plot of the game, which is gradually unraveled by the player as he or she navigates its tangled web of politics, relationships, and military stratagems, goes something like this. And, of course, there are ruinous spoilers ahead. Seriously, to the microscopic portion of my audience who has not played Mass Effect and yet may still wish to do so in future, you should turn away now. Millions of years ago, a Lovecraftian race known as the Leviathans conquered all other races in the galaxy, but found their subjects continuously created artificial intelligences, which inevitably overthrew and exterminated them. To solve this problem, the Leviathans um, created an artificial intelligence called the Catalyst, who analyzed the problem and concluded not only that organic life would always create synthetic life, but that synthetic life would always rebel and destroy it. The only solution, the Catalyst concluded, was to gather together all the biological, technical, and cultural information from the spacefaring organic life forms of the galaxy, and with it construct a new form of hyper-advanced synthetic life, which would then destroy all said spacefaring organic life forms and allow the cycle to begin again. Unfortunately, said spacefaring life forms included the Leviathans themselves, who found themselves baked into the first batch of these new creatures. To speed up the process, these new synthetic creatures constructed a network of faster than light relays, all of which led to a hyper convenient space station called the Citadel that would serve as a nexus for the cultural and technological evolution of any newly arising species and also make them easier to assimilate as they tied themselves to the synthetics technology. Every 50,000 years or so, once the peoples of the galaxy had ripened to a sufficiently advanced level, these synthetic creatures, which future cultures would dub the Reapers, would descend upon the galaxy, harvest all the necessary info, including the entire spacefaring population, create a new Reaper, and then depart, leaving the primitives like ourselves to quietly bang our rocks together until we too were ready for the harvest. All this is revealed to the player in dribs and drabs as he or she explores the Mass Effect universe. But there is one piece of crucial information that is often overlooked and occurs near the beginning of the second game. Commander Shepard, this is Admiral Zalcoris Vas Quib Quib. Do not ask about the name. You have a ship named Quib Quib? Oh, here we go. Our people have, during difficult periods, purchased pre-owned vessels from other cultures and have, on occasion, had difficulty altering the ship's registry information. The citizens of these foreign-named ships have borne the stigma of these names with grace and honor. If it bothers you, maybe you should find another ship. I've occasionally entertained the idea of requesting a transfer, but I am proud of the Quip Quip, and I will not flee because of petty insults. Did you catch it? In all fairness, I wouldn't blame you if you didn't. It's the name. Quib Quib is a character in a series that played a primary role in Mass Effect's conception, the Berserker series by Fred Saberhagen. Fred Saberhagen is not a name that sings in the ears of many, and that's not surprising. Aside from the Berserker series, his principal literary achievement was the novelization of Bram Stoker's Dracula. Yeah, you heard that. Bram Stoker's Dracula a movie supposedly based on a novel, with the author's name in its title, had a novelization of its own. But I am off track. The Berserker series is a collection of old-fashioned, muscular sci-fi action tales concerning a war between humanity 
and a race of sentient space-born synthetic life forms they call berserkers. Berserkers are essentially living fortresses, gigantic spherical battle stations with a spark of sentience at their core, constructed eons prior as doomsday weapons in an interstellar war. To that end, their creators imbued them with a primal hatred of all organic life, on the assumption, presumably, that their grateful constructs would exclude them from that definition. They didn't. And now they have annihilated most life in the galaxy. Sensing their arrival in their space, a wussy telepathic race called the Karmpan, who have somehow evolved beyond not only the need, but the capacity for violence, makes contact with a murderous tribe of hairless chimps called Humanity, and effectively drafts our species into acting as its shock troops. Given that the alternative is to be the next course in the Berserker's Feast, we agree. The precise plot of the Berserker series is less important than the ideas it sparked, though in truth, what would eventually become known in SETI circles as the Berserker Hypothesis had been evolving for years before the name was appropriated, and indeed can be traced back to the first scientist to rigorously formulate the Fermi Paradox, Michael H. Hart. In his 1974 paper, An Explanation for the Absence of Extraterrestrials on Earth, Hart argued that even at speeds equal to our own current spacecraft, an extraterrestrial civilization expanding exponentially could occupy every star system in the galaxy within just 10 million years. Given that the Milky Way is 12 billion years old, they should already be here. In fact, they should have supplanted us as our planet's dominant species before we even discovered fire. But we're still here, and they, as far as we can tell, are not. This contradiction is known as the Fermi Paradox, after Enrico Fermi, the legendary particle physicist who first asked, where is everybody, in 1950, though he never formulated the idea as Hart did. Nonetheless, the question is named for Fermi, likely because he was a world-renowned mind who not only contributed volumes to our understanding of the universe, but fled fascist Italy to save his Jewish wife from the Nazis, while Hart is a minor astrophysicist who also happens to be an unapologetic racist and white supremacist. In 1980, in his provocatively titled paper, Extraterrestrial Intelligent Beings Do Not Exist, Frank Tipler, a cosmologist and religious philosopher, expanded on Hart's idea by employing the concept of von Neumann probes. John von Neumann was a Hungarian-American mathematician who established the mathematical foundations for game theory and quantum mechanics. But he is best known today for his analysis of what he called a universal constructor, essentially a programmable device capable of producing any form of object. Von Neumann envisioned the universal constructor as a purely abstract concept, but with the rise of nanotechnology, it has entered the realm of the possible, if not the currently feasible. One might see a von Neumann probe as nanotechnology's final goal, a machine capable, with the correct raw materials, of constructing any known object, down to the molecular level, including itself. This is not technology currently available to humanity. However, no one seriously doubts the possibility of self-replicating intelligent machines. There are seven billion and counting on this planet as I speak. Self-replicating von Neumann probes are by far the most efficient method of interstellar exploration. A single probe sent out to explore the galaxy could not complete its mission in the age of the universe, but a seething, breeding fleet of von Neumann probes could overrun the galaxy in less than 10 million years. This is as Tipler noted, exactly how all forms of life propagate on Earth. To Tipler, the feasibility of von Neumann probes rang the death knell for the promise of extraterrestrial intelligence. After all, if such probes existed, why would we not see them in our own solar system? He envisioned the probes as benign, observing our existence, or even making contact. But even he speculated that they might have a darker side. Ten million years is a long time even in evolutionary terms, and a self-replicating artificial machine would suffer the same random mutations as any organic form of life. Could such probes evolve a future mutant strain whose own survival superseded its original programming? Tipler shrugged off the possibility by suggesting that fail-safes could be bred into the probes similar to those that secure recombinant DNA. However, in their rebuttal to Tipler's paper, The Solipsist Approach to Extraterrestrial Intelligence, Carl Sagan and William Newman argued 
that such protections would be futile. All a failsafe on a GMO has to prevent is infection of other organic life. No engineered microorganism could ever turn a mountain into dust or an ocean into a desert. But a rogue von Neumann probe certainly could. Sagan and Newman argued that the chance of von Neumann probes going rogue was simply too great for a civilization interested in its own survival to contemplate making them in the first place, and that it would be in its best interest not only to not create them, but to aggressively destroy any von Neumann probes, rogue or not, that it discovered as it advanced. Sagan even speculated that such a civilization could immunize itself to the technological plague. And incidentally, that is essentially what Quib Quib is, a berserker repurposed to attack other berserkers, a technological macro-antibody. As far as I'm aware, the first scientist to tie the name berserker to the Fermi paradox was David Brin, though he did so only in passing. In 1983, Brin, who, like Isaac Asimov, is both a scientist and a science fiction writer, wrote a paper called The Great Silence, The Controversy Concerning Extraterrestrial Intelligent Life, in which he outlined all the various solutions to the Fermi paradox that had emerged by that time. After discounting, as Hart had, the physical and sociological barriers to pan-colonization, he followed Tipler in exploring von Neumann probes, and then took a step further. Quote, then suppose, for every 100, or 1,000, or 10,000 sane ETIs, there is one that is xenophobic, paranoid even. Such a race might reprogram its self-replicating emissaries to add powerful bombs to their repertoire and command them to home in on any unrecognized source of electromagnetic radiation. Unquote. These probes were not random, raging berserkers, dedicated to the extermination of life for its own sake. They were methodical, targeted, deliberate assassins, autonomous blades in their master's distant hands callously, monotonously, sweeping the galaxy clear of life. One might even call them Reapers. Bryn considered his Reapers, which he called deadly probes, quote, frighteningly self-consistent, as they required the fewest assumptions about the fewest possible alien intelligences. All it would take would be for one civilization to send out its Reaper armada, and the Fermi paradox is solved. In fact, after ecological holocaust, he considered deadly probes the most plausible solution to the paradox ever devised. Quote, the effect of deadly probes on the possible lifetime of a civilization is profound. And I Love Lucy is well past Tau Ceti by now. That was in 1983. These days, degradation permitting, over 2,000 star systems could have tuned in. Bryn's slice of dark comedy hints that it is only a matter of time before the Reapers find us. But in truth, as Sagan and Newman noted, they should have found us already. Even if, as Bryn suggested, they were key to artificial radio transmissions, they should have taken us out decades ago. Enough time has passed for Reapers to have reached every corner of the galaxy, hiding in our solar system for millions of years, waiting for the signal. They could have launched an attack before we even knew of other suns. And this is one of the reasons I so love Mass Effect. It answered that question. The reason the Reapers haven't destroyed us yet is because they don't want to. They want us to grow, to mature, to achieve our fullest potential as a species, so that they can absorb that potential for themselves. And yet the true answer may in fact be far simpler and more horrifying than even Mass Effect envisioned. In 2018, Theoretical physicist Alexander Berezin proposed a hypothesis that he says, quote, predicts a future for our own civilization that is even worse than extinction, unquote. The paper is short, barely three pages long, and its assertion is stark. Quote, the first life that reaches interstellar travel capability necessarily eradicates all competition to fuel its own expansion, unquote. Berezin does not suggest that such eradication is deliberate. Rather, much as our gradual usurpation of our planet has meant that the mass of ourselves and those animals and plants deemed of use by us now outweighs that of the rest of our biosphere by several times, so these lucky pioneers would casually troll through the galaxy, 
bending every system to their will, altering worlds and draining resources to suit their needs, barely noticing until one day they and theirs are the only life left. And why have these slovenly overlords not casually swept us aside? Well, says Berezin, the only answer is to invoke the anthropic principle. The reason we have not been the victim of the waste and wantonness of the first interstellar civilization is because we are that civilization. It is, it appears, man's destiny to idly trash the heavens as he has so comprehensively trashed the earth and the sea. The Fermi paradox cautions us to fear the reapers, but perhaps one day we will see that the reapers are us.